Hello, everyone. All right, I am trying to just get where I need to be. Hi there, welcome. Thank you for joining me. I need to get better te technologically here. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, there. Put something in the chat. I am so glad you're here. I am sorry for having you wait. Um, I am Zooming tonight because I am going to be uh, sharing on my website. So I'm super excited about that. And it is not, well, it's just about six right now. So, um, I guess I will just get started. Yay. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. All right. So hopefully you are seeing this on your screen. I'm trying to make sure that I can see both of my screens right now. All right, perfect. So, All right, it's looking good. It's kind of going back and forth. I'm not sure, but this is our starting point. Yay, we made it. So welcome to our Taringa Ranch uh, Thursday night at 6 p.m. regular presentation. Uh, we've been doing this for a few months now and actually more than six months. And it's super exciting and really fun. And we're always coming up with uh, new ideas, new things to do, new people to talk to, right? So uh, before we even get started, I'll let you know that next week we're going to be interviewing Kim Cabrera, wildlife tracker extraordinaire right here. So mark that down and join us. And tonight we are going to go through one of my all time favorite websites. Um, and the reason is, there's a couple of reasons. So one of the reasons is this website is about coyotes and coyotes are probably the number one animal that I get questions about or that we talk about, right? Um, and the second thing is that this is the research that actually got me excited about talking about coyotes. So it's exciting to me, I love this. Um, and I feel like it's a really valuable resource that not enough people know about. So I wanted to sort of share it with you. Now, um, I just want to start off by saying I did not participate in this research. Um, I think this research is awesome. I wish I participated in it. I did not. I'm not affiliated with this study at all. I just think it's cool and I wanted to share it with you. So, um, so that's what I'm doing. And I did actually try to reach out to um, some of the people in the study to see if they could join us tonight, but it's super hard to find their contact info. So, um, and they're busy, they're very busy people. But what we're doing tonight, we can explore this together <clears throat> and questions we have, um, you know, I can do my best to, to answer from what I know, or I can uh, take them and um, find out the answers for you, because that's how we roll. So, um, researching urban coyote ecology and behavior, sharing findings so we can coexist. 
This study is um, super famous, actually, in the coyote world. It's super cool. And it's a little different than what we usually do. Usually when I'm talking to you, it's very specifically about Los Angeles area or Southern California coyotes. Um, but this time, these coyotes are from the Midwest and they are newsmakers. These guys um, are super urban as are many other coyotes. And they really made the news when they made a den in the Soldier Field parking lot. But well before that, this team was on it, collaring them, studying them, and we'll just see what they have to say about it. I don't even have to tell you about it because it's all here. All right, I'm gonna start with, so the top, this is how you get to the home page up here. <clears throat> and then under it, <clears throat> excuse me, you have field notes, which includes stories from the field and then stories about individual coyotes from the study. Then you have the project, and this is all about the project, the basics of studying coyotes, ongoing research, research reports, study results, partners, researchers, events, media coverage, employment, and volunteering. So lots of stuff. And then finally, they have all about coyotes, all about coyotes, how to avoid conflicts with coyotes, coyote management strategies, frequently asked questions, scientific research papers. So are we going to have time to hit everything on these lists? No, we are not. But we are going to hit some highlights so that you can then spend some more time on your own getting to know this awesome website. Okay, so uh, we are going to actually start with the project. About the project. So um, there is Dr. Stan Geert, and he's sort of the guy uh, in charge of all of this, and he has a lot of different people that work with him. Um, a comprehensive study of coyotes in the Chicago metropolitan area. The Cook County Coyote Project is a comprehensive study of coyotes in Chicago metropolitan areas, also known as the Urban Coyote Research Program. The study was initiated in 2000. So keep that in mind as we go through the website. This all started in 2000. That's 20 years ago, right? All right. At least last I checked. I never know anymore. In 2000, in a non biased attempt to address shortcomings in urban coyote ecology, information, and management. The Coyote Project is still underway. With the help of many key agencies, a continuous subset of coyotes is live captured, collared, and released at their capture site. Coyotes are monitored to understand how they live in urban areas and how they interact with other wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. So, and these studies go on in all kinds of places, this one is just um, super interesting to me. This website provides details on the study, information about urban coyotes, how to avoid conflicts, and a snapshot of the lives of some of the animals being tracked. By providing the public with this research, the project aims to initiate the first step of coyote management, public education. By becoming aware of coyote ecology, people can understand the difference between true threats and coexistence. It is important to stress that our relationship with coyotes is directly affected by our behavior. Coyotes react to us and we can foster mutual respect or a lack of respect through cues we send to them. In this research, our primary interest is in observing and only in very rare occasions do we test manipulation of coyote behavior. So, a lot of people ask me uh, where I get my information from. And um, this is one of my sources, is this study. Program focus. One criticism of this research program is that it focuses on the overall population and ignores the situation of problem coyotes. 
What has been learned from all the animals in this study, however, has provided the framework to manage both cases of conflict and those without. The issue with studying animals reported as nuisances is that often enough information on the situation cannot be obtained prior to someone having the animal removed, if the animal could even be safely trapped for study. There are also many levels of nuisance, with the term itself being highly ambiguous. Only a very small population of coyotes appears to be causing actual conflicts with humans. The Cook County Coyote Project <clears throat> gives perspective to media reports and neighborhood complaints that tend to focus only on coyotes causing trouble. Of the 446 radio collared coyotes in a variety of urban habitats, only 14 have been reported as nuisances by members of the community. While there are undoubtedly complaints we are not aware of, this number is likely a good indication of what the majority of coyotes are doing which is staying out of our way. This is the science. This is the scientist saying the science. So in those communities experiencing heightened conflicts with coyotes, it is worth a review of this website, specifically that of the consultations resulting from conflicts in Broomfield, Colorado. It is important to examine what individual people are doing in order to interpret what individual coyotes are doing. Many suburban areas unknowingly provide excellent habitat and other resources to coyotes. Identifying these things may help reduce bold coyote behaviors by ensuring proper management of attractants. Negative interactions with coyotes can be intimidating, if not dangerous, and steps should be taken to be sure issues are not ignored. Using community-wide reporting procedures can be an effective way to track conflicts to specific areas or animals. Prevention in this case is critical since lethal removal, if deemed necessary, is only a patch to cover a much deeper problem. We hope you find answers to your questions on this website. If not, or to provide feedback on a new sighting of a collared coyote in your area, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the wildlife in your community. So, but again, um, if I had any criticism of, of the site, there, I, don't, I don't know um, how to contact anyone here. So um, good thing I don't need to. So that is about the project, basics of studying coyotes. What is going on? All right, so you can see this land use map within the Chicago metropolitan area. They're showing you a highlighted area on that map. This is the larger area. This is the smaller area. And how the areas are used. And you can see how much of it is urban versus how much of it is natural. Um, this is what they call the Chicago metropolitan area and it spans all or parts of six counties in Northeastern Illinois. Um, we don't need to read the whole thing though. We're not gonna read it. We're just gonna talk about why it's here and what you can get from it if you're interested, right? So this is what they're doing. They're looking at what kinds of areas these animals are living in. How are they doing it? They're live trapping. They're putting radio collars on. And in some cases they had GoPros on their necks. I don't see that here. And there used to be a super cool video here that was um, biologists sitting in a car on a very busy street in downtown Chicago, watching a coyote that was sitting in an intersection in the grassy spot next to an intersection, probably 10 feet away from lots and lots of people all day long. None of those people noticed the coyote sitting there. Nobody gave him a second glance. It was so, amazing. I'll never forget it. I'm, I, I hope, I hope we'll come across it. I, when I was getting ready for this, I did not find it on the website anymore. So I don't, I think it might've changed. I think the website has definitely changed and evolved over time. Right. So, um, so they're using GPS collars, radio collars. They can see where they are and then they map that out. 
And when they capture them, of course, they gather biometric data, like their weight, and they draw blood. <clears throat> and they put in an ear tag to help them identify them. Um, in addition to trapping, this is interesting, in addition to trapping adult coyotes, pups are marked from natal dens during the spring. Pups are weighed, sexed, and a microchip is placed under the skin for future identification in case they are captured again. Blood or hair samples are collected for genetic analysis. Tagging pups provides a big picture view of the population, especially when those animals can be tracked for their entire life. Handling pups for the short time it takes to collect data does not disrupt parental bonds. However, all animals, whether adult or pup, are always returned to their original habitat and left alone as quickly as possible. Pup research has been featured on several news channels, including Howl City. Howl City, that sounds like fun. <clears throat> Applications, why are they doing this and how are the results to be used? Results from this unique project are used to answer common questions regarding coyotes in urban areas, with many aspects of coyote ecology having direct management implications. Although this study is focused in Cook County, Illinois, what we have learned about coyotes and people living together are indicative of many metropolitan areas. One of the research team's primary goals is making this project information available for the general public to use, not just for wildlife managers. Research provided through this website may help you troubleshoot issues or understand the behaviors of the coyotes in your own neighborhood, which is why we are here today. And if you think this is interesting, feel free to share this with your friend. Let them know about this. This is a wonderful resource. Ongoing research. National Geographic Technology Critter Cams allow researchers to join the pack. So these are going to be um, more research stuff. Okay, oh, behavioral and personality testing in the field. Tests measure coyote boldness levels. I know, coyote boldness. We talk about that a lot when we talk coyote. How do you study the behavior of wild coyotes while limiting the likelihood of unnatural responses due to human presence, traps, and or cages? Follow the coyotes into the field, of course. Two types of field tests that are being conducted on some of the radio collared individuals our flight initiation distance test and novel object tests. Both are ways to examine coyote boldness levels, where boldness is a term that describes how willing coyotes are to explore and or take risks. Note that boldness does not necessarily correlate to coyote aggression. Flight initiation distance tests are used to measure how boldly animals behave towards humans. Novel object tests are used to gauge the relative boldness of individuals, individuals to new stimuli in their known environment. Data collected from these field-based methods will be combined with other approaches to examine behavioral syndromes, I, like bold or shy tendencies, in the forest preserve, suburban, and urban coyotes throughout the Chicago area. So far, there has been quite a bit of variation across the urban gradient. And the researcher on that was Katie Robertson. Thank you, Katie Robertson. We appreciate you. All right, and, but you can just get crazy. Now I gotta go back. Cause like this, is, this, this, this website is a slippery slope. You will, you will get on one of these pages and it will lead you to another and it will lead you to another and you will just keep going because it's amazing. Let's look at this, National Geographic Technology. I love this. National Geographic's Critter Cam technology is providing a front row seat to the life of the coyote. These special collars have both camera and tracking capabilities that allow pre-programmed recording times and scheduled drop-offs. Never before seen footage has been captured from the coyote's point of view. With this technology, actual visuals can be paired with telemetry data allowing for the full study of many behaviors, such as how coyotes make the, decision, the decisions they do. For instance, videos can indicate how coyotes approach roads, cars, 
people, pets, and even prey. These observations can further be paired with other characteristic behaviors identified at capture, along with the animal's genetics, to better understand individual variations within the population. That is super interesting. What's this? Media coverage, downtown coyotes, National Geographic. An extreme breed of coyote is finding there's no finer place than downtown Chicago, where the predator has learned to lurk under the radar city of life. Among the skyscrapers of Michigan Avenue and busy Lakeshore Drive, these animals are pushing their ecological envelope, said Stan Garrett, a wildlife ecologist at Ohio State University in Columbus, who has been studying coyotes since 2000. What is this? See, now here we go somewhere else. Well, oh, it gave us a brief glimpse. That was super cool. Um, yeah. <clears throat> did it show you? Yeah, it did. Good. Okay, so then we're still at the project. Research reports, is that assessment of human coyote conflicts? So if you are somebody who's having issues with coyotes, you should, you should look at this. We'll click on it really quick. I don't, yeah. oh, this is also written by Julie Young and Seth Riley. Seth Riley is local. All right, and so now we're looking at uh, some actual papers from the city and county of Broomfield, Ohio. And this is interesting. And uh, what well, we don't have time to go through all of this, but it is very interesting. And if you are interested in how this area dealt with their situation, then you should read that. I know it's, I, I'm actually gonna go back and read it later because I wanna know what's up with that. Community level strategies for urban coyote management. Coyote attacks on humans in the US and Canada. Let's click on that. And that's gonna be a whole research paper too. That's gonna be crazy. But um, basically there aren't that many ecology of coyotes in urban landscapes. So these are all gonna be, you know, you're gonna to need to take your time to read through those. And then uh, study results. What we have learned, coyotes are common throughout most of the Chicago region. And, and, and again, this applies to Los Angeles, like almost everything except the fact that it gets really cold there. Coyotes are common throughout most of the Chicago region and radio tracking data demonstrate that people and coyotes coexist on a daily basis with people usually unaware of the potential for interactions. A few individuals can sway people to believe that coyotes are bad while the majority of animals go about their lives without ever being seen. A synthesis of results from the Chicago metropolitan area produces a portrait of a coyote that appears to benefit from the urban landscape through enhanced survival and possibly elevated population densities, while also exhibiting strong spatial and temporal avoidance of humans by consistently avoiding developed portions of the landscape and shifting activity patterns to nighttime hours. Major implications. Oh my gosh, look at that baby. How cute is that baby? As a top predator, coyotes are performing an important role in the Chicago region. Increasing evidence indicates that coyotes assist with controlling rodent, deer, and Canada goose populations. Coyotes in urban environments switch their activity patterns to be more active at night when human activity is minimal. Most coyotes are feeding on typical prey items, such as rodents and rabbits, and generally avoiding trash. Wildlife feeding will eventually habituate some coyotes, leading to conflicts. Coyotes appear to be monogamous. Coyotes are exposed to a wide range of diseases. However, to date, none of them pose a serious human health risk. In general, 
the coyote population appears to be relatively healthy. Effective control programs target nuisance coyotes rather than targeting the general coyote population. Coyotes removed through lethal control efforts or other causes are quickly replaced. There are individuals who exhibit dangerous behavior that sometimes should be removed from the population. Successful management programs include public education and outside consulting. Some types of repellents, such as electronic devices employing lights and sound, may be useful pre for preventive control of coyotes, but more work is needed to evaluate their effectiveness and other hazing techniques. Despite the importance of natural habitat for coyotes, some individuals are capable of maintaining territories in portions of the landscape with minimal or no natural areas and elevated human activity. However, coyotes as a general population consistently avoid areas associated with humans, regardless of their sex, social status, resident or transient, activity period, or the amount of urban development within their home ranges. These things the coyotes have taught us may not always remain true. Continuing this long-term study allows researchers to effectively observe small changes happening daily that may result in big changes over time. All right, they've got partners, they've got researchers. It's definitely worth looking at the researchers because they are super awesome and we appreciate them. Dr. Stan Garrett. He's really awesome. And if you think this study is interesting, then I'm going to also recommend that you um, watch Raccoon Nation because that is also um, one of his little projects. And I think it's awesome. Chris Inker, Seth Newsome, Dr. Seth Newsome, Dr. Hans Ellington, Shane McKenzie. Gabby Barnes, Alex Coombs, Summer Fink, Katie Robertson, Ashley Worth, Gretchen Inker, Heidi Garg, and Dr. Jean Dubach. And hopefully I said all those names correctly. I just wanna thank all of you for this awesome research and this cool website. All right, now, we're gonna look at field notes, stories from the field. What are these guys talking about? Trapping season, look at that. Much of our live trapping takes place during the winter months. The winter season is an important time for our monitoring as much of our live trapping takes place during this time. We got started with quite the successful weekend. As part of an Ohio State University field trip, we successfully captured and radio collared 15 coyotes from two of our sites in two days. Quite a treat for the students. This trapping took place at suburban sites where we have been monitoring resident coyotes for many years. Equally exciting is that some of the coyotes we captured were recaptures, especially four coyotes we initially marked as little pups at a den of one of our older alpha females last spring, Coyote 349 making them gangly, but cute eight month olds. Their mother, Coyote 349, was also originally marked as a small pup from a litter in the same general area many years before. Unfortunately, 349 died last summer, making these coyotes her last litter. It will be interesting to follow them as they grow older without their mother. These coyotes will soon be back in the field right where they were found, but sporting new tracking collars that will continue to teach us about their lives. Oh, look at this coyote info, basics of studying coyotes. Oh, we already did that. Yeah, um, okay. Ooh. Oh, wait, we're not there yet. We're still at stories from the field. Sorry, I got all confused. Here's something we can relate to. Well, not the cold part, but definitely the mange part, right? Brutal cold can take a heavy toll on sarcoptic mange infected coyotes. This is from 2018. The last one was from 2017, I think. They're, you know, 
from all different times, but semi-recent. The brutally cold temperatures we are currently experiencing are not normally a problem for healthy coyotes, at least for short periods, but can be devastating for those battling illness. Most of the coyotes in the area are quite healthy, but a small number are infected with sarcoptic mange, which makes them particularly vulnerable during the winter. Usually, the parasite itself does not directly kill the coyote, but predisposes it to exposure because the animal loses its coat from incessant scratching. On cue, last week, the techs recovered five of our collared coyotes, all apparently dead from exposure. But the real culprit was mange. Five in one week is notable, but all infected with mange. And the record cold temperatures are predicted to continue for another week. Note that there is little risk of mange spreading to healthy pets. So there's that. Um, and then if you look under that, you can see there, there's, you know, more here, coyote disease, uh, dynamics of sarcoptic mange in the urban coyote. They're learning more and more about that. And thank goodness for us, California is on the way to, I mean, we just sign something into law, but of course we have to watch it all actually happen. But rodenticide, right? We're finding that rodenticide, and this is not part of the website, but rodenticide uh, is being connected. So, and then down there you see the zombie dogs, severe mange cases in the Chicago suburbs. That used to be called the chupacabra back in my day. And in fact, I'm going to be doing a uh, a Halloween special where we're going to talk about what's a chupacabra and what's a mangy coyote. Yeah, now we're going to go there. All right, uh, more field notes. Concluding the adult coyote tagging season, the super urban coyotes of Chicago by Shane McKenzie. Over the past several winter months, we have successfully radio collared 11 coyotes that called downtown Chicago home. These super urban coyotes are residents of the Southwest, West and Northwest sides of the city. Of the 11 coyotes collared this past season, one in particular was a milestone for the project because it was the second time we had met this coyote. For the last 17 years, every spring, the Urban Coyote Project attempts to locate dens of radio collared coyotes that are breeding. When pups are found, each receives a microchip, similar to what your vet may use for your dog or cat, that allows us to identify the coyote in the future. One such coyote is number 1101. She was found in May of 2017 in a den near Western Avenue on the southwest side of Chicago and given a microchip. On March 3rd, 2018, she was recaptured less than a mile from where she was born, this time nearly all grown up. Although we sometimes later meet microchip coyotes again in other study areas, the extreme urban environment for 1101 is special. Coyote 1101 is the first microchip coyote within the deep urban core of Chicago that was also recaptured and radio collared in our project. For the last month, she has been tracked alongside her parents Coyote 744 and 745 throughout the southwest side of Chicago. The next big question is, where does she go next? Does she remain at home with her parents or will she decide to venture off on her own in the future? Will she choose to live in the city or will she decide to move out to the suburbs? Only time and radio tracking will tell. So cool. All right, now we're gonna go over to All About Coyotes. And they've got the basics of studying, how they do it, why they do it, conflicts, coyote management strategies, coyote relationships with other animal species, coyote relationships with people. Oh, let's look at that. Human coyote interest. There are some people who take a love of wildlife to the next level or to a personal level, making their homes as welcoming as possible for the feathered and furry who share their neighborhood. While providing habitat is desirable, Purposefully attacking, attracting wildlife can have devastating consequences for the animals themselves. It takes a community approach to keep the wild in wildlife. Human coyote conflicts. For many reasons, the popular media focuses on conflicts between coyotes and people within cities. 
Even so, most incidents are difficult for the public to interpret and place into the pop proper perspective. Many people have little idea as to what the appropriate response is to coyote news stories and inappropriate responses can aggravate the situation. Coyote conflicts can range from relatively benign sightings of the occasional animal without additional incidents to pet killings to the most extreme cases of coyotes attacking people. The word attack is often attached to a wide variety of situations, most involving a much less dramatic incident than the word attack implies. Coyotes differ from most other wildlife species in cities in that they can be considered a nuisance without any evidence of damage simply by being seen. Perhaps because of their role as a large predator, people are sensitive to the real or perceived threat to pets or children. Indeed, most complaints regarding coyotes are that they occur near people, regardless of whether any damage has occurred. Conflicts with pets. Small dogs may be taken at any time of year, but attacks on larger dogs are usually associated with the mating or breeding season when coyotes are most territorial. In some cases, small dogs have been taken while the dog was on a lead, or coyotes have jumped fences to attack a dog in a yard. Most metropolitan areas in the Midwest and Eastern United States have reported an apparent increase in the number of attacks on pets. Cats roaming outside are at an obvious risk, although the coyote is only one source of potential danger among many. Attacks on humans. Most extreme and relatively rare are cases where coyotes attack people. The majority of cases involve younger children. Most attacks have occurred in the Southwest, especially Southern California, where coyotes have lived in suburbs for decades. Prior to 2009, the only fatal case of a coyote attack in recent history occurred in 1981 in an LA suburb. However, in October of 2009, a 19-year-old woman was fatally attacked by Eastern coyotes while hiking alone in Cape Breton Highlands National Park, Nova Scotia. In Midwestern met metropolitan areas where coyotes are still considered a relatively recent phenomenon, coyote attacks on people remain isolated and rare. Are all coyotes a threat to people? It continues to be surprising to find so many coyotes living near people in Cook County, and yet relatively few conflicts have been reported. It was assumed that with an average of 350 coyotes removed each year from the area as nuisances, most urban coyotes would create problems. In contrast, only 14 of 446 radio collared coyotes have been reported as nuisances as defined by the local community. Apparently, few coyotes have become nuisances in Cook County. And it's likely that this is true of other metropolitan areas. It remains to be seen if conflicts will stay relatively rare or if they become more common as coyotes adjust to living with humans in this area. For perspective, it is worth considering that no documented case of a coyote biting a human has been reported for Cook County. Contrast that result with domestic dogs in which Cook County often records 2,000 to 3,000 dog bites each year, including some fatalities. In 2013, for example, there were no recorded bites to people by coyotes in Cook County, but 3,822 bites from domestic pets were reported. What creates a nuisance coyote? Very few coyotes that have been studied in Cook County have developed into nuisance animals. These coyotes that became nuisances during the study typically became habituated through feeding by people. In other words, People were feeding wildlife and either intentionally or unintentionally fed coyotes. Once coyotes associate human beings or yards with food, they may increase daytime activities and thus are seen more easily by people. In those areas in Southern California where attacks have been common, researchers have reported a higher frequency of human related food in the diet of nuisance coyotes. This was indicative of feeding by people or coyotes seeking food and garbage. In either case, feeding of coyotes should heavily be discouraged. A common pattern for many human attacks has been feeding prior to the incident, in many cases, intentional feeding. 
Our experience has been that most nuisance calls are in response to coyotes simply being seen or heard by residents. So um, I am looking, I don't see any comments, so that's fine. Uh, but anyway, and then they have some, well, let's look at coyote management strategies. Like, what are they talking about? Oh, education and human behavior modification. Direct management st strategies, removal, relocation, and negative stimuli. Okay, so this study, we don't relocate here in the LA area. We're not allowed to do that. They talk about lethal removal. We don't really do that. Negative stimuli, we do do that. That is hazing. Okay, so yeah, that's a little more detailed than I thought we were gonna get into. But again, you should read this, especially if you have a pet that you're concerned about. All right, and then this is super great. I'm not gonna take the time to go through all the answers to these, but these are super great questions with super great answers, right? Do coyotes and dogs interbreed? Have there been any coyote bites or attacks on humans in the Chicago area? What do urban coyotes eat? Like we already know those because we just got done reading about all that. How many coyotes are in a pack? I hear coyotes howling. Does that mean they have just killed something? No, coyotes howl for a variety of different reasons, but it would be silly more often than not for a coyote to howl over a kill. Why would they want to attract attention to their food catch? So, all right guys, now you know where I get some of my awesome, super duper cool, cutting edge information. It is the super great Urban Coyote Research Project, and I have really enjoyed sharing it with you today. So thank you so much for joining. We will continue to, what, how do I? Stop my share, all right. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. And see us next week. And next week, we're talking to Kim Cabrera, uh, and she is an amazing animal tracker. And so that's gonna be super duper cool. And um, if you like this, if you think this is interesting, um, like it and subscribe because we need subscribers to keep going and to be able to do more things on YouTube. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, we will see you next week, hopefully. Thanks again for joining.